Dr. Stephen Jackson. He's a researcher at the University of Sydney, and many people consider him a preeminent expert worldwide in IR fibroblasts. So, Stuart, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for that uh, complimentary introduction. Yes, this morning I'm going to give a brief overview of the field of fibroblasts. So I'm not going to be absolutely comprehensive. It's a huge field, probably the largest field in laser physics currently. So I'm going to be brief, but hopefully it will really give you a nice insight into the field. Uh, for those, particularly for those of you who have never had a, uh, an ins uh, done much with fiber lasers in the past, hopefully I'll be able to give you a bit of a, a taster. Okay, so basically what we're going to do this morning, we're going to have a little look at how does the fiber laser work. We're going to look at the basic principles of uh, fiber lasers. Then we're going to look at some of the, uh, the types of fiber lasers, the configurations that are out there. Uh, for CW and pulsed operation of fiber lasers. If we get time, we're going to look at the rare earth transitions that are uh, very, very important to high power fiber lasers. And I don't think we will today, but if we do have time, we're going to have a look at some of the applications of fiber lasers. But this, this lecture, this, this overview here is actually for a much longer lecture. Uh, and because we've only got an hour and a half today, uh, I don't think we'll get that far into it. So, why did I say that fiber lasers are the most important? laser physics uh, field at the moment. Well, this, this graph here pretty much demonstrates why. Here we have the output power from a fiber laser as a function of time over the last, say, 10, 12 years or so. Uh, this is the output power from a turbium fiber laser, which I'll go into a bit more detail uh, in the lecture. But we can see here, from about 1997, when they first started looking at high power turbium fiber lasers, the output power has been exponentially growing to now, there's about 10,000 watts emitted from a commercial fiber laser. That's from one fiber from a core diameter of about 20 microns. This fiber laser is emitting in a single transverse mode. It's one spatial mode and it's emitting 10,000 watts. In yesterday's lecture, we talked, we, you were introduced to the field of mode locked lasers, whereby the peak power is in the petawatt region, okay, but the average power is only a watt or two. Here, this is the opposite case. Okay, here we're talking about 10 kilowatts of average power. So unfortunately, the battery example, which Thomas was talking about yesterday, won't be enough to run these lasers. In fact, you almost need a power station to run these things. Okay, so that's the reason why this field is very exciting. This fantastic growth in output power over the last few years has really driven interest in fiber lasers. Okay, so let's have a look at how fiber laser works. Okay. In its simple, in its most simple embodiment, it really consists of only two parts. Okay, it consists of a pump source. In this case here, they are usually semiconductor diode lasers. Semiconductor diode lasers, one could argue, are the most important laser sources out there because they give us the highest optical, to electrical to optical efficiencies. But the output from a diode laser has a very low beam quality. Okay, and then the light from a diode laser has to be shaped in a special way using anamorphic prisms and uh, anamorphic lenses and so forth. But anyway, the light can be focused into a fiber, and then the fiber is then cut into a doped fiber, which contains our rare earth lines, which enables lasing to occur. So this is actually a very, the, the, the real beauty about fiber lasers is their simplicity. You can just get a pump source and a fiber, put them together, and you get a laser, and a very efficient laser at that, with very high beam quality and very efficient. Okay? And we, because the tight focusing of the pump source into our fiber, we get a very high gain, which means that the feedback required, remember, for a laser, there's three components, a pump source, a resonator, and a gain medium, okay? Because our focusing is very, very tight, the inversion, the population inversion is usually quite large, which means we don't need very much feedback. And in fact, the Fresnel reflection off the end of a fiber is enough, the 4% reflection off the end of a fiber is enough to, to get enough feedback to get these to oscillate. So these are fantastically simple, fantastically high powered, and fantastically efficient devices. Of course, if you want to get wavelength selection, if you want to really hone in the wavelength and get a narrow line width, you can incorporate gratings into this. And that's very, very simple. You can write a grating into another, fi into another fiber, you can splice it directly onto our dope fiber, or you can actually write the grating directly onto our dope fiber. Again, really, really simple. So not only do you get the fantastic efficiencies and fantastic powers, but you also get a very narrow line of operation. So there's not much these, these systems can't do. 
Okay, so as I've already mentioned, uh, the, pref the preferable pump sources for our guide lasers are, uh, for our pump for our fiber lasers are diode lasers. Diode lasers are semiconductor uh, systems whereby there's uh, electron hole recombination in a zone between a PN junction. I won't go into what, how diode lasers work today, but nevertheless, what happens is we get a pump source, is our diode laser, we uh, focus that into our fiber. But of course, as I mentioned already, these diode laser sources are very low beam quality. They have very large divergence in one plane and a very high, horrible beam quality in the other plane. Okay, so we can't really focus into the core of the fiber very well with diode lasers. So what we've done is we've developed what we call a double cladding. Okay, whereby we have the normal sort of cladding around a fiber. Remember, an optical fiber is composed of three parts mainly, a core and a cladding. The core guides the light and the cladding surrounds it and provides the numerical aperture for the guidance. And I won't go into the uh, optical fiber physics right now, but just let me just say that the light from our guide laser is generally incident on the cladding. It's a huge cladding. These claddings can be about uh, between 100 microns and over a millimeter. Okay, the core size is usually somewhere between 5 microns and say even 50 microns for our large motor area cores. Okay. And as I've mentioned here, most of the demonstrations have all been in silica-based optical fibers. Silica is a fantastic material. It's hard to make. You have to make it at very high temperatures, but actually that helps you because that means it's a highly uh, robust material. It's got a very, very good thermomechanical properties, and you want that if you want to make these things, these fiber lasers run at very high power. So the fiber lasers that are most demonstrated to high power fiber lasers involve silica-based glasses. Okay, I just want to point out this little truncation here in the cladding is also very important and I'll go into a little bit of detail about that later on in the lecture. Okay, so these are very simple, okay? Very simple, just a fancy, it's a nice core. And I guess this is a conference about advanced materials and in fact a lot of technology in the last 20 years that has gone into fiber laser development is all about how we make our fibers, how well we make our fibers, how low loss, we want our fibers to be low loss. Okay, it's very, very important, and we can do that by the special fabrication methods that make an opt optical fiber. So, I think I've solved fiber laser pretty well already. Here we go. So, uh, let's have a look at the types of optical fibers that are relevant to fiber lasers. <clears throat> well, apart from efficiency and power, there is, we want to have uh, polarization maintained, so we might want linearly polarized light, so we have uh, uh, we design our fibers like this one, for example, whereby there's a, a doped ytterbium core, and around that core we have boron doping here. Boron has a larger thermal expansion coefficient, so when the fiber's drawn, remember it's custom and preform, okay, that it's drawn into a fiber, when it's drawn into a fiber, these areas here contract faster than the surrounding silica glass, and that causes a stress across our fiber, a mechanical stress. And we have a mechanical stress in a linear direction that causes birefringence, and birefringence leads to polarization issues. Good, positive polar polarization issues because we want to get linearly polarized out of that, uh, apple from our light. Uh, there's, this is an example here of uh, what we call a holy fiber. Okay, here we have an active core. Here, this is our again most likely is ytterbium doped, and here we have a strain that we have a, uh, the uh, some holes. Those holes are going to later on in the lecture, they're very, very important. We can actually establish very important properties in our fiber, just to how we arrange these holes, the size of the holes, the space between the holes, and the actual overall two-dimensional arrangement of the holes. We can actually get specific properties from our fiber. And for example, this one, here, this one around here has an air cladding. Remember that we're focusing the light into our cladding, okay? We want to have a large numerical aperture. We want that cladding to capture as much of the light as possible. So the way we, well, one way of doing that is by putting a polymer around there, a low index polymer, a low refractive index polymer, but a more clever way is to actually have what we call an air cladding around the fiber here, and that creates a very large numerical aperture, and hopefully I'll be able to go into that a little bit more detail later on in the lecture. Okay, so basically, before the advent of fiber lasers, okay, most solid state lasers were based upon a four-level transition in the UDVM. Okay? And remember from the basic laser physics, a four level transition involves four energy levels. And here we have a, a very a, a brief schematic of that. We have a pump 
which is usually an optical, an optical transition here where we have a pumped level. That quickly de-excites down to our laser level. Then we have our stimulated emission process. This level here is our lower laser level, but it's usually either thermally coupled to the ground state or near thermally coupled to the ground state, which means we have a very, very short lifetime. So this level de-excites quickly down to the ground state. So essentially our population inversion is the difference between this energy level and this energy level. And because there's nothing down here, then the population inversion is mainly controlled by this. It's very efficient. You don't have any reabsorption. It's an, a very efficient way to generate laser radiation. And this is what the dominant species was, neodymium. This transition in the neodymium was what was dominating uh, solid state laser physics for more than 20 years, maybe even 30 years. But since we're able to now uh, tightly focus our pump light into, a, into our doped uh, region, or near our doped region, then we can get the more complicated uh, three-level transi transition to oscillate. Now the problem about three-level transitions is that the lower laser level is the actual ground state. Okay? So what we're relying on is a, 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 usually a large degree of pumping. We want to get population out of the ground state and up into these excited states so that the population difference between the upper laser level and the lower laser level is sufficient to actually get optimal gain. Okay? Now, I won't go into laser physics too much today because I just want to give you a brief overview, but the fact is this, this works very, very well in a fiber laser arrangement. And that's now, what's happened now is, is that the most important transitions in, laser, in solid state laser physics aren't the four level transitions anymore, they're in fact the three level transitions. Euterbium from euterbium, thulium, erbium, and holmium. Okay? So now we've moved away from a, an easy set of physics to a much more difficult set of physics, but the fiber laser allows us to get these laser transitions to work quite efficiently. Okay, so let's have a quick look at absorption and emission. Okay, this is the absorption spectrum for the euterbium ion. Okay, we have a strong absorption around about 920 nanometers here. There's another strong absorption here in about 980 nanometers. And we can see this is the emission spectrum. Okay, this is what we call the zero line energy. Okay, this is the, between the, the lower stark level of the ground state and the upper stark level, uh, the lower stark level of the, of the first excited state. I won't go into details about dystroscopy too much, but nevertheless, we see the emission spectrum is quite broad. It goes up to around about 1150 nanometers. And so what we do is we target this absorption with our diode lasers. Okay, so the diode lasers are really efficient pump sources that give us really high electrical optical efficiencies, we target this absorption feature here, or this absorption feature here, okay, and then we laser these much longer transitions here. And generally speaking, the, the euterbium likes to laser between about 1,050 and 1,100 nanometers. And we see lasers there quite well because we note that there's very little reabsorption. This, sort of, this, this little tail here of the absorption spectrum starts to peter out at about 10,050 nanometers, by 1,050 nanometers. So there's a very little reabsorption loss, okay? So that's why these lasers work quite efficiently. You see that the pump wavelength and the laser wavelength are very close to each other, okay? Which means that's why we get such a high efficiency from our laser system. Right. Okay, so the Euterbium fiber laser essentially is a two-level, roughly what we call a two-level system in its most simplest form, okay? Thomas yesterday said we can't get two-level systems to work, but because it starts splitting, okay, these rare earth ions are sitting in a crystalline field, okay? They're sitting in a field. All these ions are sitting in a field. When you have an ion sitting in a silica matrix, for example, we have uh, charges around the deuterium ion, and they split. You remember from your basic physics that you have a, an ion in a, a, an electric field, we get star splitting, and this is exactly what we get here. We get star splitting here. And in fact, what this enables us to get these, with this, st this star splitting, in fact, really adds to our efficiency, it really makes these three-level systems work quite well because, let me explain, here we have an absorption transition here, okay, we get, we're pumping into this double state here, the, the, uh, the F3, uh, 5 and 2 level, and we get our emission down to the ground state, but because our terminating energy level of our laser transition is high up in the start levels of our ground state, all right, the actual population inversion between here and here is actually quite large because of the thermal Boltzmann distribution of our population down here. So most of, the, most of the population in the ground state sits down here. But because our terminating transitions are up here, there's actually little population up here, which means that we don't need to pump these things too hard, like in a true two-level system, to get these things to oscillate. And because of this very efficient arrangement here, where we have our pump wavelength 
and our laser wavelengths being very, very closely spaced, the ytterbium laser is, is probably one of the most important and the most efficient fiber lasers that has been developed. But it does generate wavelengths only at around about one micron. And my interest over the years has been running fiber lasers at two and longer, two microns and longer. Okay, so let's have a look at the basic understanding of a, of a laser. Basically, the output power from a laser is a linear proportionality to the absorbed power. We see here that the, in this equation here we have the laser output, okay, and it's equal to our slope efficiency, uh, and it's times the difference between the absorbed power at threshold and the current power that's, that's being absorbed. So we have the absorbed power here, which is this pump power along here, and this is our threshold pump power here. So the amount of output power there is a linear proportionality to these terms here, all right? So with a fiber laser, okay, really the main thing we're trying to enhance is our slope efficiency. It's the slope of this graph here, because really these days there's so much output power, we're not really worried about threshold anymore. In the old days, when you had large modes in a solid state laser system and the amount of output power from a diode laser was small, we were very concerned about power, especially about, about threshold pump power, okay, especially with these three level systems. But now there's oodles of pump power out there, okay? We're not really worried about it. And in order to get high efficiency from our laser system, we just want this slope to be as high as possible. And as I've said before already with the ytterbium on, that is true because our pump wavelength is so close to our laser wavelength. Is that graph a good example, like five watt is the threshold? Five watt threshold, this, yes, that's about right, yes. Yeah, they're quite large. Remember that the, uh, this threshold is proportional, and I'll get you the threshold equation in a moment, but we'll see that it's the area. Okay, so with these fibers, the area is quite large, which means our pump threshold is quite large. But if we pump into the core, where our core mode is, where the pumped area is smaller, the thresholds are also smaller. But I'll get to that to a good point, and I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so as I've said already, the critical parameters, really the most important parameter that the fiber laser is its, is its slope efficiency. Okay, all right. And theoretically, the Stokes limit, okay, which is the ratio of the pump wavelength to the laser wavelength, is our sort of our theoretical limit. We can't normally go beyond that with a normal sort of standard rare earth ion transition. But if I get time, I'll show you there are some tricks where we can supersede this Stokes efficiency limit to get what we call two for one transitions, where we get two laser, trans laser photons for every pump photon. And as I've mentioned already, the threshold, we want this to be as low as possible, but it's not really a big issue in these big super high power lasers. These 10,000 watt lasers, even if you had a 100 watt threshold, who cares? You know, you've got that much power, and there's that, the slope efficiency is that high, it's around about 80% these lasers, that the threshold becomes less and less relevant. So that's the thing we're finding with these high power systems, that it's all about slope efficiency. Okay. We have a malfunction. There we go. Is that right on this one? No, hang on. Ah, uh, no, did this one. Didn't you? Here we go. Which one's that? Alright, okay, here we go. Oh, this will do. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this, this is the, the, uh, the, the general format for pumping the end of a fiber. Okay? The most basic way is to pump directly into the core. That's where your rare earth vapors are, that's where you get all the absorption. Okay? Uh, so you, we have, you know, our core diameters of, you know, maybe 5 to 20 microns. So we really need to tie, we need to usually have high beam quality pump source to do this. We want to be able, in order to focus into that sort of tight regime, we have to have the very high quality beam, which we don't normally get with our high power diet. So what we do is we pump the cladding, and eventually the light gets absorbed in the core, eventually after that many bounces through the, through the cladding. Okay, and what we find here is that because of pumping this very large area, and we have a very large numerical aperture between the cladding and the, and, and, the, and the polymer, or the air cladding, which I'll talk about later. There is a bit of misalignment tolerance there too, which makes these lasers a little bit more robust. If you pump directly into the core, you've got a very, very tight constraint. But if you pump in the cladding, okay, the constraints and the tolerance is a little bit reduced. So that means that we do have a, these lasers, whilst we are focusing into a very tight spot, are still quite robust. And that's a very important issue for, for field applications. Okay, so this is a a quick summary of a, of a pump, of the types of pump arrangements that have been demonstrated. Here we have a very simple arrangement. We pump into one end of the fiber. There's a mirror that highly transmits the pump light, highly reflects the laser light, and the output comes out here. And there's our 
for this example here, we have for no reflection at the end of the fiber. The other arrangement here is we pump uh, through a, a dichroic mirror that's at an angle. Um, the light's absorbed in the core of the fiber, then the bounce, lights can bounce back through, so we can get a double pass of the pump light through here. This mirror here reflects both the laser around the pump, and the output comes out here. And then this is an example where we can combine both, so we can get pumping to both ends and getting output from one end. So they're very simple. There's nothing complicated about this, really. Uh, the optics is very simple. We're just using big lenses, usually aspheric lenses, to get the light in there. But the problem about these systems is that we're pumping the ends of the fiber, so all the heat depositions is all located in the ends of the fiber. That can be an issue. And one way around that is to pump along the fiber, what we call distributed pumping, and I'll get to I'll get to that a bit later on. But it's a way of scaling the output power without too much damage to the end. So this is an example of, uh, of our dyed laser sources. This is one we have in the lab. This is a 300 watt commercial dyed laser system. Uh, when you're running at 300 watts plus, you have to start thinking about the lenses. Even at less than a percent absorption in the lens starts producing heat. And so we actually have to cool our lenses down using water. Uh, this is a common prop issue with regards to very high power, cooling the lenses down. And this is another example here of a dyed laser. This is what we call a dyed laser stack. Okay, so we have basically light that is emitted from each of these little facets along the end of the fiber, and we can use big lenses to get that light into our into our cladding, Okay, we have to individually address each one of those emitters using a special uh, lens arrays or hyperbolic uh, cylindrical lenses. But I won't go into that too much. But this is the this is the more common way that we can get uh, generating light. We can get this this system here is probably a, a, perhaps a, a one kilowatt, maybe a two kilowatt dyed laser system. So they're very very compact. There's a I think that's a quarter there. So they're very, very compact systems. And fibers being very, very small, diets being very, very small. Uh, fiber lasers do lend themselves to some degree of compactness for the amount of output power. Why is that? Here we go. These little laptops here, these little minis are a bit slow. But nevertheless, because it's actually quite a big file, lots of photos and it's actually little problems. Okay, so let's have a look at fiber lasers versus bulk lasers. And I want to go into a bit of detail about this today because it's really important to see the comparison between the two systems. Okay, fiber lasers, because we're drawing fiber, optical fiber, they're mainly made out of glass. It's very, very difficult to get long lengths of crystalline material. So what we're doing here, we're actually putting rare earth ions into glass. Now glass is not a crystalline material, of course, it's amorphous. And that means the, the rare earth ions sit in different sites. Okay, they have a different surrounding crystal fill, okay? which means that we are running... What's happening now? Uh, restart later. <laughs> Thanks. Wow, okay. <laughs> Can we get rid of that? Okay, I'll, I'll keep talking while this is going anyway. Okay, so basically what happens is... Um, okay. <laughs> I don't know, I'm running for a lot. <laughs> So here we go. So basically, let's just get back on track. So basically, these rare earth ions are sitting in different sites, different crystal fields, which means that we can look at the sum total of the fluorescent spectrum of a rare earth dope glass is very, very white compared to a crystalline material. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on that at the moment. Okay, but just as I mentioned already, these three systems are running at a comparatively lower threshold than a bulk solid state system because we're tightly focusing the pump. But because we have core diameters of only, what, a few tens of microns at best, we can't get much energy. And compared to bulk solid state systems, which can run at many, many joules, okay, this is probably the biggest weakness of a fiber laser. We just can't get that much energy extracted out, all right? Okay, but on the other hand, we get very high gain compared to bulk systems. That's because we're pumping, we're getting very, very tight pumping, which means we get large population inversions. And that's one of the reasons why the earthium dope fiber amplifier, which is probably the most important manifestation of uh, optical fibers, has been really well uh, taken up in the telecommunications field. Uh, optical fiber lasers have comparatively weak thermal lensing. Remember what thermal lensing is? That basically means that as a, as a glass heats up, okay, we've got a, an asymmetric pump profile. That means the hot, the, the, the center of our rods gets hotter than the edges. Okay, that starts forming a lens, which is pump power dependent. Okay, but because our cross sections of our core are much, are very, very small, uh, we don't get as much thermal lensing compared to the bulk systems, and this is a fantastic uh, property of fiber lasers. 
which means that we can get single transverse mode operation over all of our pump powers, okay? Whereas normally for a bolt system, we only get single transverse mode over the specific pump level of pump power, okay? Or therefore at one value of the output power because of this thermal lensing issue, okay? So basically, fiber lasers are suited to very high average power operation. Whereas bolt lasers, there's still room for bolt laser physics, but that's mainly, due, that's mainly around high energy Q switch systems and also high energy mobile systems as well. All right, so let's have a look at the bandwidth. Okay, so this is a this is the uh, the fluorescent spectrum of a single of a single rare earth ion in a crystalline uh, in a uh, in a crystal field. We see as a function of pump out, just grows and grows. It's all very usually described by a Lorentzian function, but as I've already mentioned. Uh, rare earth ions in a glass matrix or any other amorphous matrix, each, the individual crystal fields as a result of the surrounding uh, geometry of the glass induces a variation in the fluorescence so that what happens is the overall fluorescence emitted from a rare earth doped glasses is massive and in fact can span over hundreds of nanometers whereas in a rare earth doped crystalline material it might only be 5 nanometers wide, 10 nanometers wide. So that's one of the big pluses. These fiber lasers because they're in a rare earth doped glass, can actually be highly tunable. You can tune across the entire wavelength span here. And this type of broadening, if you remember from your basic laser physics, is called inhomogeneous broadening. Okay? It's inhomogeneous because not all the rare earth ions have the same type of broadening, broadening going on. Okay? Whereas in the homogeneous broadening system, they're all getting the same sort of broadening processes. Okay? Alright, so here we go. This is, the, this is the equation, and I won't go into the, how we derive this equation. But what I want to point out is that for, in order to reduce the threshold of, a, of, our, of our fiber laser, what we want is a large stimulated emission cross-section, a large lifetime of our upper laser level, we want a large overlap interval between the pump and the signal, and we want, of course, higher effectivities. But what's important here is a small area. Okay? This is the pumped area of our fiber. So as we go to smaller and smaller area, the threshold of our systems goes down. Okay? And that is really, really important because then remember, we're sort of, we can focus our, our, we can get fiber lasers with a pump size of around about 100 microns, which is much, much smaller than normal sort of uh, bulk systems. So this is, a, this, is a, this is one of the key parameters in the, uh, in the fiber lasers. And if you look at the gain, again, it's inversely proportional to the area. So again, we find that as the area of, the, of our pump mode gets smaller, the gain gets bigger. Or the, if, in the case of a core pump system, the area of our core as it gets smaller and smaller the gain increase for a given amount of pump power, which is our absorbed pump power here. So again, we're reducing our threshold and we're improving our gain when we scale down the size of our fibers. Okay. Now this is an example of why fiber lasers have such weak thermal lensing issues. Okay? Here we have, this is the this is the temperature profile across of an optical fiber of a 315 micron. Uh, diameter fibre with a core diameter of 4.6 microns and an absorbed pump power of 180 watts. And we find that, that the temperature difference across the entire core is very, very small. Okay? And thermal lensing is proportional to the difference in temperature between the centre of the core and the edge of the core. And because in fibre lasers, most of the energy drop is, most of the temperature drop is across the cladding. There is very, very weak, there's very, very small temperature gradient across the core, which means that there's very, very uh, small amounts of thermal lensing. But with modern fiber laser systems, which hopefully I'll get into the, later on today, where we have to expand the size of the core in order to take into account the optical damage threshold and other processes, thermal lensing actually for super high power, and when I say super high power, there's been calculations out there where we want, we're starting to think about 100,000 watts from a fiber laser system and then with those systems we have to start thinking about thermal lens. But nevertheless, for the sort of fiber lasers that uh, I work with and most people work with, thermal lensing is not a problem. Okay, so uh, one of the main issues about fiber lasers which is really, really important is the fact that the spatial mode profile coming out of a fiber is mainly determined by two things. It's determined by the size of the core, okay, and the refractive index difference between the core and the surrounding cladding. And if you solve Maxwell's equations and you go do some theoretical stuff, you find that if you get the core diameter right, 
and you get the, the numeric collapse or the, the refractive index difference between the core and cladding rod, you can get that laser to run on a single transverse mode, no matter what the pump power is. Okay? And that's really important. So that's why the 10,000 watt fiber lasers, they're still running on one spatial mode. They're still running on this mode here, the LP, what we call the LP11 or the 1000 mode, if you like. Okay? Now, the, this is the big issue because if you start running at higher order nodes, for example, here's the 1 zero node where there's, there's, a, there's a radial node here, or 2 zero, or, and you find here that with the zero 01 node we have a node in the azimuthal direction. Okay? If we start running on more modes, then what we're finding is, is that these are all running at different phases within the, at a different phase within the core of the fibre, we're finding that our beam quality drops and we can't focus the light nice and tightly. The applications, the couple of applications that are useful for fibre laser starts to drop. So, what, and this is a real problem for bulk solid state systems because, you know, these modes start to oscillate, you know, as a function of pump power. So what happens is you'll find that with a bulk solid state system, you'll get it running nice and well, you know, low order mode, at say around about threshold, and as you start increasing the pump power, thermal lensing starts changing the cavity parameters, and you start getting these other modes to oscillate, and the beam quality drops. Okay? So that's the one of the really important, one of the major issues with regards to fibre lasers, is that we can get these things to run in one transverse mode, and we can get super high beam quality from our fibre laser systems. Okay? Alright. Now, I think I've already alluded to what the single transverse mode condition is, but it's a very simple relationship. We have in, in optical fibers, we have a, a special parameter which we just call the V parameter. Some theoretician come up with U, V, and W versus the major parameters in optical fiber physics. But nevertheless, it's called the V parameter, or some people call it the V frequency, incorrectly though, of course. And it's, it's equal to the numerical aperture. Uh, multiplied by a factor of 2 pi uh, times r on lambda. And the numerical aperture is basically the square of the core index square minus the plate index square, so that's our numerical aperture. So we can see our variable parameters are basically how we design our fibre. And we can change it, we can change the materials in our core to improve the uh, core index, so we can raise the index. Uh, we can put material in the cladding to reduce the index or raise the index. So we have all these parameters we can play with. But nevertheless, what we want is this V parameter to be less than or equal to 2.405. This is actually the first zero of a, you know, the first order vessel function, but I won't go into that. And when we satisfy this parameter, this, this condition, and we have this, this set of, this, this, uh, these factors here equal to 2.405, we find that the laser runs nice single transverse mode. Okay? And here's an example of a higher order mode situation whereby when with higher order modes we have different propagating angles incident on the uh, interface between the core and the cladding, and that just leads to messy output basically. We don't want that. Oh, goodness. Okay, five minutes, what did you Oh my god. <laughs> okay, let's just do this. Restart later. Alright, okay, so once the condition is fixed by the fiber, single transverse mode can operate irrespective of the pump power. Okay. Actually, this bottle is the first time I've ever operated this little mini uh, using a large organ visual system that perhaps it's put in. Okay, alright, let's find what it's going to do now. Alright, so it's not ha happy about something. Alright, what are we doing? Oh no. I think it's churning away at something. Oh, here we go. Alright. Let's have a look at it now, the types of fibre lasers, or perhaps this is a good time to stop that. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Alright, okay, let's look at the types of fibre There's heaps of fibre lasers, different arrangements, depending on the application. Alright? So what we're going to look at today is with standard configurations. This is a standard oscillator, basically a, a single oscillator by itself with a couple of mirrors, gain medium and so forth. Uh, one of the more important manifestations of our standard configurations is a master oscillator power amplifier which I'll go into a bit of detail. Some of the big demonstrations of high power has come from this. Uh, we're going to look at some pulse fiber lasers. We're going to have a quick look at Q-switch. We're going to have a brief look at mode lock. I think after yesterday's uh, very informative lecture, I won't go into too much detail about that. Uh, then we're going to look at super high power CW fiber lasers. Uh, and then we're also going to look at a quick look if we get a chance on some nonlinear fiber lasers. Okay. So you can see that you know, we're covering a fair breadth of output uh, uh, situation here. So basically, 
the most, as I mentioned before already this morning, the most simple, but the most simple arrangement for a, a fiber laser is what we call a linear oscillator. Linear in the sense that we have a standing wave pattern inside of our resonator. So we have our pump like we flex it into the core, or to the cladding, as I mentioned, to keep the Apple power high enough. We have a couple of dark mirrors and there goes your laser light. Nothing can be more simple. I know. And this is one of the reasons why everybody's got these fiber lasers in their labs these days, because it is so easy to operate. And the other way to do it, to get more refined output, we're going to have a couple of brow gratings in here. This could narrow the line width right down, but of course, we only, sometimes we only need one grating to set that up. We don't need two, but for, for some experiments and for some parameters, we want to have two. And this linear oscillator arrangement is by far the most popular and probably perhaps the most important arrangement. Okay, but there are other ways to get a fiber laser to run. What we do here in this arrangement here is we're trying to get the laser to run in, a, in one direction only. Remember that if we have, if you know from yesterday's talk, if you have a standing wave resonating, you can get stand, a number of standing waves inside the cavity, okay? These are our longitudinal modes, okay? And this actually starts to be a problem because with a, with a large number of longitudinal modes, we have very, very broad output, okay? But for some applications, we don't want to have such a broad output. And effectively, we only really want one longitudinal mode to oscillate. But one way to get uh, a, a narrowed output from our laser is not to force standing waves in our cavity, but to have a travelling wave arrangement like this. And this is very, very simple. Here we have our pump light, okay, at 980 in this case. It's coupled into our resonator using a WDM, a wavelength division multiplexer, or a coupler, okay, which basically lets radiation come in. This, our pump light and our laser light go into one port. This here is, this is usually um, index match and doesn't take part at all in the cavity arrangement. Here we have, so the pump light comes into our WDM, okay, then it's absorbed by our urban date fibre. This little WDM feeds out our laser light, okay, but some of the laser light goes in back into our cavity. This is a polarisation control, which is very important to keep what we call unidirectional operation going because we have an isolator here which forces the laser to work in one direction, one, one direction and to be literally polarised. So what happens is the laser light whizzes around here really, really quickly. The pump light comes in this direction, our laser light comes out here. So now alignment and polarised. Fantastic. So not only is it efficient, we're getting some really nice wavelength uh, characteristics now. Okay, and then we can start doing some really fancy experiments with this. Okay? Because when you've got, you got polarisation, you can do nonlinear optics. When you've got narrow alignment, you can do nonlinear optics. So these sort of arrangements are very useful for uh, for nonlinear optics, but they're also very, very important for mobile lasers, which I'll come into uh, talk about a little bit later on. Okay, the master master oscillator power amplifier arrangement is also very important. And here, this is a very simple. This is what we have. This is a very simple schematic of a of a, a mobile system. We have our seed source. Now, our seed is basically uh, usually a low power laser. Okay. And what we're trying to do is we, we, we do all of our precision control here. We, we narrow the line width, we stabilise the intensity, we make it linearly polarised, we do all of our high finesse stuff with this seed laser. So we have all, so, so it's not, for, for sometimes these, to control the output, we have, we have to live with a little bit of loss, okay? So we can live with a little bit of loss here, so we just do all of our high finesse and our high control uh, activity with the seed laser, and then we just amplify it. Okay, we just amplify whatever we've done in the seed laser, we just amplify it. And we can see here that we have an amp three amplifiers. We can have a lot of amplifiers, in fact. There are systems with more than just three. Uh, and we have an isolator here, and this isolator here is very important. That prevents light from coming back into our seed laser. If you remember with our lasers, if you're having any feedback, that's going to disturb our laser operation. And if you have broadband light coming back in, that's going to reduce, uh, increase our bandwidth of our output. So we have these isolators between our amplifiers to prevent light coming back into our system. So light only moves in one direction. So what we find is that when we have our seed laser and a number of amplifiers, we get this really, really high power output uh, with the characteristics, our line width, our polarization, our frequencies, and all that sort of stuff, our stability to some extent, controlled by our seed. It's a really nice way to get. Uh, really useful high power and usually high efficient, high highly efficient output from our systems. Okay. All right. And this is a typical Mopar arrangement. Uh, these are commercial devices now. Again, with our seed laser or isolator. And what we have here is a number of fiber coupled pump modules. We have six 225 watt 
guide laser systems with their fiber couple. That means the light from our guide lasers is, is launched into some multi-mode fiber. And here we have a six to one beam combiner, which I'll go into a little bit of detail now, uh, later on, sorry. And we, all that light is then launched into the cladding of our, of our euterbium doped uh, fiber, and the output comes through here. Okay, so this is an, an amplifier with only one uh, uh, stage, but obviously we can have, we can repeat this stage again and again and again and again. Okay, there are some limits to this, but this is just a simple single stage uh, amplifier. And of course, one of the more important things about our amplifiers is that we have, we don't want, we want to prevent feedback. We don't want uh, light to be reflected off this end face of our fiber back into our situation, into our uh, amplifier, because that will cause a laser. And this is an amplifier, so we don't want to have any. Uh, feedback. So there's some fancy ways which I'll get into a little bit later on about how we prevent feedback back into our amplifier. Alright? Okay, let's have a quick look at some Q-switch uh, fiber lasers. This is what we call active Q-switching. Okay, so again we're here, we have, this is an early, very early, this is like mid, uh, mid 80s I think this experiment was first done. But it was one of the, I think this might have been the first ever Q-switch fiber laser. Okay, whereby we have a pump light from a dye laser which is focused into the core of the neodymium fiber. There's a mirror here which highly reflects the laser light and highly transmits the pump light. And we have another uh, lens arrangement here. And this is our Q switch. What the Q switch is, okay, it's a loss modulator. Okay, what it does is it modulates the loss inside of our cavity. Okay, and it's done externally using um, RF electronics, all right? So basically, it's a very simple arrangement whereby if we, if we modulate the loss, so for example, if the loss inside of our cavity is very, very high, okay, then all the energy that's coming from our pump source begins to be stored in our near dim that fiber. It's not going anywhere, okay? It's not oscillating, it's not being, it's not being stimulated by the presence of, uh, of a cavity, a resonator, all right? And then we open up our Q-switch, we make it instantaneously, or near instantaneously, uh, low loss, which means that the light quickly builds up inside of our cavity, and bang, out comes an output pulse, and that's a Q-switch pulse. The Q is defined as the energy stored to the energy loss per round trip. So, the Q-switch is a fantastic way of generating high peak power, high energy pulses from a fiber laser arrangement. And here we have so this was the first demonstration of a Q-switch fiber laser, and I think about a year or two later, a second demonstration came out, whereby uh, the, the Q-switch was arranged at a slight angle, so that when the Q-switch was off, okay, it actually, um, when the Q-switch was off, it actually allowed the light to go through unimpeded, but when it was on, the light deflected off the Q-switch through Oh, I don't get into too much detail about how these things work, and that formed the laser cavity. Okay, and then an upward pulse came. Uh, I think it came through this diprobe mirror. See here. So, pump laser came through, lens focused it onto our fiber. There's an end cap here with an angle here to prevent feedback. Q switch, bang, and upward pulse, upward pulse came through here. So, again, another nice, simple embodiment of a fiber laser producing pulsed output. Time for a break. Okay, alright. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do this. Alright, thanks. Um, okay, everyone, we'll take our, our quick break now. A um, couple of minutes of questions for Stuart on anything for this last session.